You know, I always feel a real weight of responsibility about preaching every Sunday and being here at this place to teach you the Word of God. But I have a particular sense of urgency about these last three messages that I will preach to you as your lead teaching pastor. And so I have just felt compelled of the Lord to to challenge us to keep Jesus' main thing our main thing. If you were to ask Jesus, Jesus, what is the main thing? He would say, make disciples. Or in places like Mark 13, 10, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. This is the priority. If you were to ask the Apostle Paul, what's the main thing? 1 Corinthians 2, 2, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So we have to keep the main thing the main thing. And one of the greatest challenges that any church faces is to make sure that we don't get distracted by lesser things. And there are a thousand lesser things that can distract us. Lights, music, the paint color in a room, coffee. There are a thousand things that we can twist off over. Things that can keep us distracted from the main thing. But we're here today to remind ourselves that the main thing for Jesus is to make sure that the gospel is proclaimed, this message that Jesus Christ was God who became a man. He lived the life that we're supposed to live. He died the death that we deserve to die. He was raised from the dead to give us victory over death and over sin and to make it possible for us to have a relationship with the God of the universe. And the proclamation of that message unleashes enormous power. That's why Paul would say in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Now just think about that statement. The power to save everyone who believes doesn't matter how far a person is from God, doesn't matter how messed up their life is, doesn't matter how unlikely it is that they would ever become a follower of Jesus. But when we trust in Christ, there comes this new life and this new love. This is the making of disciples, and it's Jesus' main thing that has to remain our main thing. J.D. Greer, in his new book, Above All, puts it this way. We have a gospel too great and a mission too urgent to be distracted by any secondary thing. Everything we do in our lives and in our churches must be run through the filter of how well it enables and deepens our gospel mission. Now, the dilemma is that most believers uh, will will agree that... uh, Everybody needs to hear the gospel. The, the, the deal is that they don't believe that they're responsible for doing it. So the responsibility in the minds of a lot of believers today is that that proclaiming of the gospel and the making of disciples is the responsibilities of the professionals, the staff members and preachers and missionaries. And, uh, and so they're happy to sit back and applaud people on the stage and those other Green Berets who, who just do the hard work week after week. But the very clear teaching of the New Testament is that this responsibility for proclaiming the gospel and making disciples rests upon the shoulders of every one of us. All believers have this mandate from Jesus. And so, the uh, measure of effectiveness for churches has to change. So it's not about how much money we raise or the buildings we build or the names we add to the roles. The measure of effectiveness 
is how many disciples are making disciples. Again, that's Jesus' main thing. Now, I get overwhelmed when I think about um, the enormity of the task. The millions of people here in the Metroplex that need Christ and billions around the world. And so it's, it's a bit overwhelming until, until I can break it down into something very manageable and very small. And that is when I can think about, is there one person, one person I can pray for, I can love, and share the gospel of Jesus with them in the hope that they will put their trust in Christ and become a follower of Jesus. Just one person. That's manageable. That's doable. So we're going to spend the next six weeks with this question before us. Who's your one? Who is that one person that God would have you pray for, love, and share the good news of Jesus with over the next few months? And we're going to let the Word of God and the Spirit of God uh, instruct us and equip us and inspire us and motivate us. So open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 1 and verse 29. I want to show you from Scripture the pattern that Jesus put into place from the very beginning of his ministry. So his plan for building his church and expanding his kingdom is to make disciples who make disciples. That's his plan. And in John 1 here, we're introduced to an amazing, mighty man of God by the name of John. We know him as John the Baptist. And his mission, he was a prophet along the lines of the Old Testament prophets. And his mission was to pave the way for the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. So you look at verse 29, and it says that John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, just jump ahead to verse 34, where John says, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. And so, John's mission is our mission. And and, and that mission is simply to testify, to bear witness to to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, here's how this plays out. Look at verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. So John is not only preaching to crowds, but he has built this relationship with a couple of his apprentices, his followers, his disciples. And... uh, and so he is passing the faith along. When, when Jesus passed by, he said, look, that's the guy I've been telling you about. That's the Lamb of God. And when they heard it, we're told here that they followed Jesus. So John has passed his faith in Jesus to these two friends of his. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, look at verse 40. Andrew Simon Peter's brother was one of the two who heard what John had said and had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. So this Peter, as you may know, would ultimately become uh, the most outstanding uh, leader among the disciples of Jesus. And yet it was his brother Andrew, who first brought Peter to Jesus. So now there's three generations. There's John, there's Andrew, and there's Simon Peter. But it doesn't stop there. Look at verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael. And told him, we have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. 
So Jesus calls Philip to follow him. He does, and before you know it, here is Philip finding his friend Nathanael, and he's introducing him to Christ. And then when Nathanael has some objections about who Jesus is, Philip just says, Cuss, come and see. Well, what a simple approach. Just come and see. So Jesus moves along these lines. This is his pattern, his plan for building his church and expanding his kingdom. It's disciples making disciples. Now, let me just show you how this works out, practically speaking, for us today. If this is to become real in our lives, here's here's how it works. First, understand who Jesus is and why he came. Understand who Jesus is and why he came. So we have to know Jesus well enough and love him passionately enough that we can simply talk about him to other people. In verse 36, what John John is introducing Jesus to his disciples. That's what we're doing. We're just introducing people to Jesus. And notice he says, look, the Lamb of God. Of God, So John knew that much about Jesus, that he was the Lamb of God. Now, Jews would, would, uh, would know immediately what John is referencing here. Any Jew that went to the temple to worship would have seen lambs sacrificed to atone for the sins of the people. And so when John calls Jesus and introduces Jesus as the Lamb of God, he understands the mission of Jesus, that he has come to die on the cross of Calvary and there to be the final and ultimate sacrifice for the sins of all men. So after Jesus died, no more sacrifices were necessary. And when Andrew brought his brother Simon to Jesus, notice how he introduced Jesus in verse 41. He said, we have found the Messiah, the Christ, you see, the Jews had long expected the arrival of this Messiah. They, they, they were looking forward to it. They understood that he would come to redeem Israel and deliver Israel from their sins. And, and so here is Andrew saying, listen, I, I know this Jesus is the one that we have been looking for and longing for. He's the guy. And then Philip, when he brought his friend Nathaniel to Jesus, notice how he introduces Jesus. Again, we become skilled at introducing Jesus to others. Verse 45, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And so Philip understood that the Old Testament Law of Moses and the preaching of the prophets all pointed toward this one who would come to save us from our sins. And and Philip understood and communicated to, 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 to Nathaniel that this Jesus, this historic figure, Jesus Christ, is that one that the Old Testament pointed to. So we need to be able to understand who Jesus is and why he came if we're going to effectively introduce him to other people. So our, so our goal is to connect our friends with Jesus. It's, it's, not, it's not that we, we want them to, to uh, just uh, to adopt our opinion about things or even to join a church or to come to church, even though that, that is important ultimately. Our testimony, though, is about Christ and that the Bible, everything the Bible says about him is real. It's true that we have in him life and love and liberty. There's a sense in which, though we are not mere customers, there is a sense in which we, as followers of Jesus, have to be satisfied customers. And the greatest advertisement for the gospel are people who know and understand who Jesus is and why he came. That's very important. Number two, being a disciple-making disciple also means you take responsibility for your circle. You take responsibility for your circle. So we all live in a circle of relationships, and the gospel moves along the lines of those relationships. So John 
had in his circle a guy named Andrew, and he brought him to Jesus. And Andrew had in his circle his brother named Simon Peter, and he brought him to Jesus. And Philip had in his circle a guy by the name of Nathaniel, and he brought him to Jesus. Now, for some, some of us, our circle is full of people that are far from God. So this isn't a big, a big challenge for you to, to, to identify. Your, your, your challenge is, who, who, where do I start? But it starts with you taking responsibility for your circle. For others of us, particularly if we've been believers and churchgoers for a long time, our circle is pretty small and may not include anyone who is not already a believer. And so the challenge is we have to take responsibility for that. If I ask you to pull out your phone right now and to text a non-believer and set up a coffee with them tomorrow, would you have that person in your contact list? Sadly, I don't think many of us would, but that's the goal. So, so, so what do we do if that's the case? If our contact list doesn't, doesn't include anyone that we know is far from God, well, we need to expand our circle. And how do you do that? But just, just think about this for a moment. Change the traffic pattern of your life. Most of us kind of get in this rut and we're in the same traffic pattern. We run across the same people all the time. And if we're, if we're churchgoers, most of those people are church people. So how do we change the traffic pattern of our lives? Well, just start maybe, check out a service organization like, like uh, Meals on Wheels or volunteer for, to work in, in, in a pregnancy center or a mercy clinic or, or volunteer, sign up for Kids Hope and be a mentor for boys and girls at George C. Clark. Uh, just pay attention when you're, when you're out in public and you're the, at the cleaners or being served at a restaurant or in a waiting room of a doctor's office. Be interested in the people around you. You never know the paths you may cross in those places. And of course, one of the greatest places to connect with people who are far from God is the workplace. Uh, we, we have a guy in our church who owns uh, an engineering company and uh, has, has uh, a lot of employees and recently, he and his wife went to see the movie Overcomer. It's a powerful Christian movie with a great gospel message in it. If you haven't seen it, I want to encourage you to go uh, support it. It's a great, great movie. Well, he and his wife went to see this, and they came home, and he emailed uh, all of his employees, and he said, this, this is a great movie, and I want to encourage you to go see it. And as a matter of fact, I'll pay your way. I'll buy your tickets, and I'll buy you a Coke and popcorn. And if you have... If, if you have a company credit card, you could just put it on the credit card. He's the boss. He can do that. And if not, then bring your receipt to the accounting office and we'll reimburse you. You see, that's, that's what it looks like to take responsibility for your circle. You know, research consistently reveals that 80 to 85% of people who come to church or come to Christ have come through the influence and the impact of a family member or friend. So we have to take responsibility for our circle. You know, people in our culture today, you understand this far better than I do. People in our culture today are probably not going to look at an advertisement for our church and think, wow, I want to get down to that church and hear that pastor series on Ezekiel. I can't wait. They're not going to say, wow, I... I'd love to go hear that cool music. They can hear it in a lot of different places. For people like that, in our culture today, most people, their first step toward Christ is going to involve someone who is in their circle. A family member, a friend, a classmate, a coworker who's shown them the life and the love of Jesus Christ and they're thinking in their head, I, I need what they have. That's, that's where it starts. So take responsibility for your circle. 
And obviously, Jesus is the one who does the drawing and does the saving, but amazingly, he chooses to use us in that supernatural process. And by the way, don't let the haters keep you from speaking up. Maybe you saw on social media what uh, New Orleans quarterback uh, Drew Brees did recently. He, he, he simply challenged students to take their Bibles to, church, uh, to uh, school with them. And, um, of course, just this firestorm erupted. You would have thought that he had asked them to take guns with them to school. And, and the haters started cropping up on the Internet and claiming that all he was doing is trying to stir up an animosity against people that aren't Christians and gays and lesbians and everything else. Of course, that's the furthest thing from Drew Brees' mind. I'm just reminded today that we live in a culture and function in a culture where it, it, everybody has the freedom of opinion but believers, Everyone else has the freedom to, to their opinion except believers. So we just need to understand that that's the culture, that's the climate, that's the environment in which we are living out our faith. But we cannot allow that to keep us from speaking up and unashamedly talking about Jesus to others. Now, Drew Brees, he, he came back and, and, boy, to his credit, he said, that's not what I'm about. Anybody who knows me knows that's the truth. He said, I, I, Jesus is the only way. The Bible that we hold in our hands teaches that. But he is, a, he is a savior of love. Nowhere does Jesus condone hating. Nowhere does Jesus condone any kind of, of bigotry. He loves all of us just like we are, but he loves us too much to leave us as we are. But understand that when you stand up with that kind of message, you're still going to get labeled a hater. And don't let it keep you from Standing up. So take responsibility for your circle. Number three, pray and plan for a gospel conversation. Pray and plan for a gospel conversation. Again, Jesus is the one who does the saving. He alone can save. So that means that we want to talk to Jesus about our friends who need Christ. We need to pray for them. Now let me just ask you to, to suppose that God answered every single prayer you've prayed in the past week. Just think about the things that you've prayed about, as you, you can remember. Every single thing you've prayed about in the last week, what if God answered every one of them? Would there be any new believers in the kingdom of God because you prayed for God to save them? So a huge first step is just to get them on your heart and on your prayer list. So as you meet people that you, you're not sure where they are spiritually, just get their name and start praying for them and looking for the opportunity and the door that God might open for you to have a serious conversation with them about Christ. So talk to Jesus about your friend and then talk to your friend about Jesus. Build a relationship. Get involved in their life and be interested in their lives. But remember that the goal ultimately is for them to know Christ because that's, this is where a lot of us get stuck. We, we're okay with being friends, but we don't know how to get to that point where we can have a serious conversation with them about the gospel. And I understand that. I get that. That's the toughest part of this process. So we look for ways to move it from the casual to the more serious. We look for ways to move it from the physical things to spiritual things. We look for ways to move beyond just religious talk to have a serious conversation about the gospel. And somewhere in there, maybe to invite them to church. And again, that's what John did with his friends. In verse 36, he said, he told them, it says he told them that Jesus was the Lamb of God. When Andrew found his brother Simon, verse 41, he told him that Jesus is the Messiah. And when Philip found Nathanael, he, verse 45, he told him that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. So at some point, we have to get down to having that serious conversation about Christ. 
You see, if something or someone is important to us, we really typically have no problem talking about it, even with strangers. I mean, you talk about your kids, your grandkids, with total strangers standing in line at the grocery store. You, you talk about your favorite football team or who you're going to vote for, whatever. It's easy for us to talk about things that are important to us and people who are important to us, even with total strangers. And so prepare yourself and pray for the right time to have a serious conversation with your friend about the gospel. So again, you're explaining this message that God came to this earth in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who died, who, who lived the life that we're supposed to live, died the death we deserve to die, was raised from the dead to give us victory over sin and death and to make it possible for us to have a relationship with the God of the universe. That's the conversation we want to move toward. And you feel awkward? Join the crowd. All, all of us do. Most of us do. And we talk about spiritual things with people. One of my favorite definitions of evangelism is this one nervous person talking to another nervous person. And even to this day, I, st I still feel that. And so don't feel alone. Don't worry about saying the wrong thing. Listen, God can fix it. He can fix it. If your motivation is right, he can fix it. The Holy Spirit living in you gives power for witnessing, so trust him to give you the words to say to your friend. I tell you, I've seen this over and over again where I get into a conversation and I hear myself saying stuff that I know didn't come from Mike Dean. I, I know how I think. And I hear stuff coming out of my mouth that I know had to come from the Holy Spirit. And that's not just something for me. It's something that's available to every, every one of you. You don't have to have all the answers or say exactly the right thing. It's just one thirsty person telling another thirsty person where to get a drink of water. And something else. The disciples that we see being made here in John chapter 1 all became leaders in the movement. And I think that's significant, that we are disciples who make disciples. And we don't just make pew sitters. We make apprentices who are following Jesus and making a difference in the world, disciples making disciples. So pray and plan for that gospel conversation with him. And then four, trust your one to Jesus. Trust your one to Jesus. When we introduce our friends to Jesus, he says, got it. I'll take it from here. He's, he's working in them in an amazing way. When John connected his friends to Jesus, remember those two in verse 38 and 39, we're told how they start following Jesus, and Jesus stops, and he looks back, and he sees them, and they want to know where Jesus is staying. He says, just come, I'll show you the way. John introduced them. Jesus took it from there. When Andrew introduced Peter to Jesus, Peter said, I know you. Jesus said, Peter, I know you. I, I, I know you. And, and I, in fact, I have a new name for you. You see this in, um, in verse 42. I, I have a new name for you because I have a new destiny and a new future for you. Just think about that, that Jesus, before Andrew ever brought Simon to Jesus, he, he had plans for Simon. Or Philip brought Nathaniel to Jesus, and in verse 47, Jesus says this, this is a cool scene here. Jesus said, I know you, Nathaniel. This is Nathaniel in whom there is nothing false. This guy has a pure heart. And Nathaniel said, how in the world did you know that about me? Verse 48, Jesus said, Nathaniel, before Philip ever brought you to meet me, I knew you. So you can trust your one to Jesus. Believe it or not, he knows your one better than you do. He loves your one even more than you love them. And before you've ever thought about making them your one, Jesus already had them on his heart and on his mind. He's already 
working. So this whole process of disciples making disciples succeeds because of Jesus. So you can trust your friend to him. So the goal in all of this is it's not about just recruiting people to our cause. That's not what this is about at all. This is about being so in love with Jesus and so enamored with Jesus that we cannot help but share him with the people we love. That's what this is about. That we have found Jesus to be all that he says he will be. And if we truly love people around us, we want them to have that as well. More than likely, you were somebody's one at some point. You were somebody's one. Now, who's your one? So we want to keep this before you over the next several weeks. And the way we're going to do that is there's a card in the seat back in front of you there. <clears throat> part of it is a bookmark and part of it is a card that's with a perforation. And so maybe as I've been talking here today, you already have your one in mind. This is the person that you already have that person in mind. Um, I've already written the name of my one on my card. And over the next few weeks, every Sunday, I want to give you an opportunity as you come to identify that one that you would just write their name, just their first name on the card. Now, I'm just going to say, don't put your, your child or your grandchild. Obviously, we want our kids and our grandkids to be saved. I want you to think outside of that circle, Okay. And over the next today and over the next few Sundays, as God puts that person on your heart, I want to ask you just to tear off that card and just bring it here to the altar. These for the early service this morning. And just bring it and place it here. What we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to give these cards to our prayer team, and they're going to pray for you as you witness to them and as you build that relationship. So you're going to have some partners in there. So you could keep the bookmark. And it's got some scripture passages that you can read every day as you're praying. And then we also have available out in the, out in the foyer uh, some, a 30-day prayer guide. If you'd like to really dig deep in this and pray fervently for 30 days, we've got a guide. You just pick one of these up out and either exit here today. And maybe if you're preparing to have that, that serious conversation with your friend about Christ, one of the tools that we have found to be very effective in our culture today is something called Three Circles, a life conversation guide. And it's, a, it's just a very uh, modern way to think about our need for the gospel. And we have those available. You can pick one up and start studying on it, thinking about it, and, uh, and how you might share it with your friend. But we come back to the question, who's your one? Let's bow our heads. Lord, you told us that you came to seek and to save those who are lost. Jesus, that's your mission. That's what you're about in us and through us. I thank you that you came to seek me and to save me and you did that when I was a young teenager. And I thank you for the people you used. I was their one. And they were faithful to pray for me and to love me and to share the gospel with me. And now, Lord, would you use us in that way? Show us the one that you've placed in our circle that needs Christ. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. And as we're singing and worshiping over the next couple of songs, if God has already put that person on your heart, 
then just write their first name on the card and just bring it here to the front. So we, we're going to collect these and pray over these. We're going to do this every Sunday for the next few weeks because you may, you, you may need some time to think about who that one is. And we want to give you that time. And, uh, but each Sunday, as you, as you come to that realization, just bring that card here and, uh, and we'll join you in praying for them.